Scared to death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. You're Lindsay Lou Who. Uh, oh, oh, is that where I get that? Lindsay Lou Who? Yeah, I call somebody, I call Emily Emmy Lou Who. Maybe. Oh. It's like Cindy Lou Who from the Whoville. Yeah, I didn't know that I was also taking it from you. <laughs> uh, question for you. Uh, oh. Do you like cool, interesting, and wild stickers? Oh my God, I do. Well, great news. Uh, it's been a while since we dropped a sticker dump. Uh, so we've got a few to choose from. Yay! New ones. Spoopy bitch sticker. <laughs> horror addict sticker. Uh, little demon, nightmare man stickers. You can head over to badmagicmerch.com. Look through the sticker bin. I'm laughing because like, well, it was just a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I was driving on the freeway like, yeah. from our house to into Spokane Valley. And I saw like a Chad Daniel sticker on the back of someone's oh, car. Yeah. But I didn't know. What does it say? Like, it says it's, uh, it's really inappropriate. Appropriate. Drive slow, don't rape. Or I like think. drive safe, don't rape. Drive safe, drive safe, like, don't rape. Yeah. What is that Comes about? From some random and, joke. But then it was right next to a time suck sticker, and I was like, what is he talking about on time suck anymore? <laughs> what is happening over there? So immediately you start talking about stickers, and I just did. Just flashed on that. Well, then I was thinking, like, oh, it'd be so great if that person also had a spoopy bitch uh, sticker. Yeah. That'd, that'd be quite the combination. <laughs> uh, we also have a, a new keychain available for anybody who wants that. I love keychains. And then that's the only announcement I have. I know you have oh, a charity announcement. And I sure then do. we are off into Storyland. Off to the races? Mm -hmm. I'm okay. excited. And, and Dan and I are both <clears throat> going to try to not sing Amy Winehouse because for the last hour I have been relentlessly singing it. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be fun to conjure Amy up into this episode with a Ouija board, but Dan said no. <laughs> so I might sing a little bit though and try and see if I can get her here. Uh, this month's charity is so excited to announce we have our a dollar amount. Uh, we will be donating $14,795 uh, from our patrons to the Rainbow Railroad. The Rainbow Railroad, founded in 2006, is a nonprofit that assists LGBTQI plus people facing persecution because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. So basically, the Rainbow Railroad will take people who are in uh, harm's way because of who they are, yep. who they love, how they identify, and get them to a safe place, whether that's mm -hmm. getting them out of a country, getting them to a safe house, or, you know, could just be some other mental health kind of help. But they're a totally incredible uh, nonprofit. And if you're curious, if you need help, if you know somebody who needs help or you want to get involved, you can go to rainbowrailroad.org. And then just as a reminder, on top of that nearly $15,000 donation, uh, uh, $1,643 will be set aside for the uh, co upcoming Cummins Family Scholarship Fund, which mm -hmm. we will be announcing and sharing all the details on that in January of 2023. We're just building it out right now, and it will be open for applications next year. Sweet. Yay, scholarships. Yeah, good stuff. Lots of good stuff. I know, it's so fun. Um, okay, so how many stories do you have to tell us today, uh, milady? Oh, I don't know where I thought you were going to say it. Well, me and my friend Amy Whitehouse are going to tell you two <laughs> stories. Uh, my first story, a creepy imaginary friend scenario, but seems like the kid that is actually the the tangible child yeah. is making some weird, creepy premonition prediction kind of situation. Okay. It's like, where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. And then in my second story, I think that we have the possibility of a, a, a dad using a Ouija board unbeknownst to his other family members and bringing something into the house. Okay. We haven't had one of those in a while. No, no. Secret Ouija board use. I have uh, my two. Uh, the first from some strange dark corner of the web, uh, undocumented claim of paranormal paranormal horror at a setting we have never explored before, an escape room. Ooh. I love this story. Oh, boy. That is a terrifying concept all onto itself. Yep. Unto it, itself. It plays out like a sequence from a horror film that I'd like to watch. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't like this already. Uh, and the second, uh, another very creepy little lingerer. 
like last week's curse tale. Mm -hmm. This week I share the tale of a mysterious disappearance and then reappearance, and the details shared by the person who reappeared almost make you wish they would have just stayed disappeared. What they said happened in the in the days they were gone okay. is very unsettling. Sorry, I am hung up <clears throat> on the escape room scenario. Oh, we're getting into it. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay, I'll talk about it later, but I yeah. want to discuss the escape room that you and me, your ex-wife, and her husband all did together. Oh, I forgot that's we did that. that's completely normal. Yeah. And it kept getting darker and darker in the room. We oh, remember. yeah. We'll tell you more about that in the after story some portion of the show. I can't talk. I'm so distracted. <laughs> I'm so freaked out. So a little bit of time to settle in. Okay. Uh, you have some, there you go. Wait, check out these chicken socks. Well, the roosters actually. Cock a doo doo doo. Cock socks. Cock socks. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Cock block socks. <laughs> what? What? I was talking about chickens. Oh. Um, it's okay. So here, here we go. Uh, over the past decade or so, many people across the world have found a new favorite game, escape rooms. In case you don't know, escape rooms are usually places you go with a group of friends or family or your ex-wife, <laughs> uh, to uh, be pretend locked inside of a room filled with interactive puzzles. <laughs> you solve clues one by one as a team to figure out how to escape the room. Or escape your ex. <laughs> it can be a nice team building activity or just an opportunity to use your brain in a fun and immersive way. But some say that escape rooms aren't without their dangers. Most escape rooms have some form of panic button, whether that's telling the game master that you want to leave the uh, locked room or simply just exiting through the unlocked door you came in. While it's fun to pretend to be locked inside a room, what if it wasn't all pretend? What if the stakes were a lot higher than just exiting with or without the pride that comes with conquering the game? What if suddenly a panicked need to escape became terrifyingly real? What if you truly worried that if you didn't win the game, you wouldn't leave with your sanity or even with your life? That would be what Elise and her friends claimed happened to them. One fateful, unforgettable birthday adventure. Time now for the tale of You'll Never Escape. Elise had never been much uh, for escape rooms, but her sister Lena absolutely loved them. Those who knew them were usually surprised by this fact. People who met Elise and Lena also uh, often surprised when they were first introduced to them to find out that they were sisters. They couldn't have been more different at the time of this story's telling. Elise was in her early 20s working a string of random temp jobs so she could make enough money to do the things she really wanted to do, travel the world, learn languages, uh, and in all honesty, get drunk and go out while Lena fit the archetype of the responsible older sister to a T. Lena, who had studied business in college and immediately went to work for a startup afterwards, had a different definition of a good time. A bottle of rosé, the bachelor on TV, Ugh. satisfaction of knowing she could pay all her bills for at least 90 days with only the money she held in savings, and being in bed by 11 so she could start the next day no later than 6. And yet, she was the one who loved escape rooms. Escape rooms. Something that seemed far too silly and frivolous for Elise to actually enjoy. But Lena had tried it during a work retreat and had ended up loving it. Are you sure that's what you want to do for your birthday? Elise asked when Lena proposed the two of them, plus Lena's boyfriend Aaron and whoever else Elise wanted to invite go to an escape room that weekend. As she spoke, Elise looked at the company's website, a little building off the highway, snapshots of people holding up signs that said things like, we did it, escape room queen. A lot of the groups were wearing matching t-shirts. It all seemed so cheesy. I know what you're thinking, Lena said, but trust me, they're fun. And I don't know, she trailed off. I guess I feel like we deserve a little bit of fun. Elise immediately felt guilty. Lena would never say it out loud, but Elise knew exactly what she was talking about. Of course she knew. Six months earlier, their mother, only 51, had been killed in a random hit and run accident. Mm. And they were both incredibly close with her. One day they had the best mom in the world. And the next, they both had to begin processing the sad fact that they'd never talk to her, be hugged or held by her, or simply be loved by her ever again. Elisa dealt with this new hole in her uh, that would never be filled in her own way, mostly through a lot of drinking, waking up in places she didn't remember falling asleep, while the bulk of the logistical work and actually dealing with their mother's death had fallen on Lena. Lena had never once complained about having to do it all on her own. Their father wasn't in the picture. But now that she was in a somewhat better headspace, Elise wished she'd been more present for her sister the past half year. Oh, I, I just meant I'd never done one before. And I just, you know, didn't know what to expect, Elise said cheerfully, minimizing the window on her computer as she spotted her boss across the office. She lowered her voice. I should probably go, boss making the rounds. But I'll call you after work to work out the details, okay? Love you. Love you too, Lena said. Go work. Aye, aye, Captain. Elise said and hung up so she could pretend to look busy. Later, when things had quieted down for the day, she went back to the escape room's website. She'd never say it to Lena, but the idea of being trapped in such a small space with their game master watching over them in a, through a hidden camera, kind of made her skin crawl. 
She was reminded of a story she'd heard growing up about a guy who'd had a heart attack while playing a game of charades, and no one did anything to help him <laughs> because they thought it was part of some scene he was acting out. How was she supposed to know what was real and what wasn't in the game? What was part of the game? What was not part of the game? The whole notion just gave her the creeps. Ha, 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 ha! At least jumped in her seat before realizing the sound had come from her computer. On the monitor, where she'd been looking at her escape rooms, there was now a pop-up ad that read, Friday the 13th, escape room. A gif of a man with an axe played over and over in sync with the laughing sound. An animated clown above the gif raised a little knife. Its eyes popped out and blood dripped down its face. Book now! A button at the bottom flashed. Heart hammering in her chest, Elise closed the pop-up. She was glad that none of her coworkers had seen her jump. They were all out for lunch. She was also glad she had a few minutes to calm down a bit before they returned. Even though it was a bright, sunny day outside, she couldn't shake the feeling of being watched now. Of something wanting to catch her off guard. She felt twitchy. Maybe she was a bit claustrophobic. She never felt that way before. But she'd also never been in an escape room. She tried to put the panic she felt out of her mind. And eventually it did pass. Later that week, Lena called to confirm that they were on for Saturday, and she said she and Aaron would pick up Elise at her apartment. Elise had invited their child for childhood friend Nora to come along. Everything seemed to be going according to plan. It was only when the four of them arrived at the escape room on Saturday afternoon that Elise felt her stomach drop. What escape room did you say we'll be doing again? Elise said, peering out of the backseat of Aaron's car at the small office building. On the side of the building was a banner with the same graphic she'd seen on the computer. Friday the 13th, escape room. She'd previously hoped, prayed, that they were doing anyone but that one. Maybe something with a silly historical theme, something light and goofy. The Friday the 13th one, Lena replied cheerfully, adjusting the small plastic crown on the top of her head that said birthday girl in glittery letters. It was just the kind of thing Lena would never wear and Elise had insisted she wear it. Elise felt sick. She didn't want to do it, but she also wasn't going to say anything and possibly ruin her sister's birthday party. Oh, cool, Nora said, smiling. Lena and Elise had been friends with Nora since childhood. She'd grown up next door, and though she'd been a shy kid who loved art and comics, she'd blossomed into a cool graphic designer with a sleeve of tattoos and a roster of high-end clients. I love those old slasher movies. I just wanted to feel like a real escape room, you know, Lena said. Like the scary ones always feel the most real. Like there's actual urgency. Feels like it's not just a game. Aaron parked the car. And I guess if we get too scared, we can always drink our fears away afterwards. Exactly, Lena said. I'm glad we're on the same page. Were they on the same page, though? As Elise followed the rest of the group across the parking lot, she felt a chill pass over her skin while the voices of her sister and friends talked about which parts they'd be good at. The logic puzzles, the word clues. That all felt distant, like they were talking from several rooms away. She hesitated before crossing the threshold into the building when Aaron held the door open for her. But, again, she didn't want to be the person who ruined her sister's birthday. And if she was going to say something about how she currently felt, what exactly would she even say? That she was worried that the advertisement for the escape room was luring them in and not to make money? That something just felt off? That the room might be real? What could she say that wouldn't make her sound like a huge scaredy cat or a crazy person or both? So into the building she went. And almost immediately, Elise no longer felt scared. She almost felt embarrassed for being afraid of something that was so cheesy. The lobby area was little more than an office space with a stained drop-down ceiling panels and a small podium for checking guests in. The walls were covered with the same photographs she'd seen online, smiling families and groups holding up signs that indicated whether or not they'd beaten the game. On the other side of the lobby, there was even a gurgling water cooler and a stressed-out dad checking his cell phone, muttering something about being late for a restaurant reservation in a spot designated the waiting area. It was all the opposite of scary. They were greeted by a cheerful guy in a red polo who stood behind the podium. His name tag read David, and he waved at them with a smile. Welcome in, guys. You have a reservation? While Lena went to confirm their reservation, Elise lingered by the doorway. Unable to help himself or herself, she was wondering what their mom would think about them doing this for Lena's birthday. Like Elise, their mom had always been the one pushing for a little bit of fun. Skipping school on a beautiful spring day to hang out in the park or having breakfast for dinner when they didn't feel like cooking. Would you be happy for them? She thought she would. Would she also be proud of Lena for keeping it all together while Elise allowed her sister to barely keep her head above the rising tide of work and responsibility? Almost unconsciously, Elise's eyes fell on the photos again. And she gasped. Instead of the signs that said things like, We did it! And I'm a superstar! The signs now said something different. Help us! Read one. Don't trust him! Said another. A third held by an older woman who Elise could have sworn had been smiling a moment ago, but now looked like she was in agony. Said, Don't do it! 
Ready? David's voice rang out and Elise jumped, tearing her eyes away from the pictures. What the fuck was that? Elise demanded. Lena stared at her, concerned, from across the room where she was already beginning to put her purse in a cubby. What was what, Elise? The pictures, Elise said alarmed. The signs in the pictures are super fucked up. She turned back to the pictures. But now they were all normal. Everyone smiling, holding goofy signs. Elise felt her stomach drop. Uh, sorry, what? David laughed nervously. I guess they're sort of cheesy, but a lot of groups like to commemorate their wins, or I guess their losses too. It's like a keepsake. But if you don't want it, it's not required or anything. Out of the corner of her eye, Elise caught Lena giving Aaron a look. She knew that look well. It was the look Lena had given her when Elise lost all of her luggage on a vacation they'd taken in high school. Ugh. The look when she'd accidentally rear-ended their mom's car when she'd be learning how to drive. It was a look that meant that Elise was fucking up. And that Lena was frustrated with her, but didn't want to say anything. Sorry, Elise blurted. I don't, I don't think they're cheesy. I guess they just looked off or something. I don't know. Maybe I'm just scared. She tried to laugh, a sound that came out weaker than she thought it would. I guess, I guess I'm just feeling a little claustrophobic or something. She offered up her bag to Lena to put in the cubby, almost like an apology. David grinned, grabbed the keys on his lanyard to lock the cubby. All good, he said. If you get too scared or just not funny anymore, there's a panic button installed right by the door. As soon as you press it, you'll be able to get out, get some fresh air and water. Just, he made a face. Please don't throw up in there. <laughs> Elise got the feeling that that had happened more than once. She didn't know whether to feel ridiculous or concerned. All right, off we go, David continued, leading them down the hall. Nora trailed beside Elise, looking mildly amused at the rows of doors marked with numbers. Behind the doors, they could hear faint giggles and shouts. Check the lockbox! I, I need help with the code! Then David paused at a door marked three. All right, he said, his cheerful face suddenly turning serious. Sixty minutes on the clock. The time starts as soon as the door closes behind you. The door swung open, leading to a tiny interior chamber. For a second, Lise wondered what, uh, if that was it. H uh, how would they solve puzzles with only a few feet of space to move around in? Before she realized that it was a foyer, air foyer, yeah, foyer area, and they wouldn't be able to see the room until the door was already locked. We got this, Nora said, and soon Elise found herself inside the chamber. She heard the lock click behind them. Then, very faintly, she thought she heard David laugh. And then, Welcome to the haunted Ho Montpelier. Welcome to the haunted hotel Montpelier. A voice that sounded pre-recorded boomed over the speaker. Today, the day of your check-in is Friday the 13th. Unfortunately for your souls, this is also the day that the ghost of the Montpelier Axeman comes to seek his revenge. It is now 11 p.m. Escape the room by midnight and you may travel on. But if you stay past midnight, the Axeman will come for your souls and you'll stay forever. Under the voice, Elise thought she heard the sounds of something thudding against the walls. Something like an axe. She also suddenly wasn't fully sure that the voice was a recording. Creepy, Lena whispered. The key to the escape is in your grasp, the voice boomed. If you need a hint, turn to the mirror on your left. You have three hints. The game master will be monitoring your progress, or lack thereof. Three hints, Aaron said. Well, hopefully we won't need them. We can use the hints, Nora said. It's a game, right? Like, we paid for it. We should be able... Yeah, but it wouldn't be a real win if... The door swung open, and they stepped inside the room. As Elise's eyes adjusted to the darkness, she made out furniture and props, exactly the kind of things she'd expected, like a musty bed and creepy-looking portraits on the walls. An open suitcase was at the other end of the room. A timer on the other side of the room started counting down from one hour, and the mirror was to the left, as promised, except it was actually a TV screen. Cool technology, Elise thought. All in all, it was a good replication of a haunted hotel. Down to the bloodstains, it seemed to be everywhere, especially on the bed. Sheets were almost soaked in it. Before she could look too closely, some of that blood seemed very real. Lena was yelling in her ear, Go, 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 guys! Split up! Go look for clues! Anything that can help! While Lena went to investigate the cabinets, Nora dashed for the suitcase, looking through scraps of paper for a code. Aaron ran to the portraits on the wall to see if he could try and get a clue for the number of faces or maybe the pattern of the frames. And Elise... Elise didn't know what to do. She suddenly had the feeling she was being watched. Not like the game master was watching them, but like there was something else in the room, something no one else was noticing. There's a key behind the painting, Aaron yelled. Anyone have anything with a key? I got something, Nora said, lifting a small jewelry box out of the suitcase. Here we go. A frenzy ensued as they opened the jewelry box and found five silver dollars. And then Lena shouted that the small jukebox looking thing on top of the desk might take the silver dollars. And then they all played a game to match the tunes in the right order with the buttons on the wall. And for a moment, Elise forgot about the feeling of dread. A secret door behind the curtain popped open to reveal a hidden underground passageway that was actually just a small crawl space where Lena found three sets of keys. 
and Elisa looked back at the clock to see it had already been 15 minutes. One of them must be it, Lena cheered. We got him! We just have to figure out which one. And then the lights went out. Guys, Lena called, what, what's going on? M maybe it's some kind of trap, Nora said. Or maybe something's supposed to glow in the dark, Aaron suggested. Then Elise gasped, because something was holding her hand. Ugh. And by how far away the other's voices sounded, it wasn't any of them. Get away from me, she screamed. Get off of me, get off! Elise, Aaron yelled, are you okay? Is this part of the game, Nora asked, but Elise couldn't reply. Whatever it was had slipped out of her hand, but she could still feel something around her. It felt like there were multiple hands touching around her, shushing her, trying to get her to stop. Wait, Nora said. A moment later, a beam of light pierced through the darkness. I forgot I had my phone. I guess I was supposed to put it in the cubby. She frowned. Are you okay, Elise? Elise squinted into the light. As far as she could see, the hands had vanished. And then, in the mirror slash TV screen behind Nora's head, the one that was supposed to feed them hints, she saw a message. Don't tell them. It vanished as soon as it appeared, and Elise looked around wildly. Guys, we have to get out of here. Something's not right about this room. It's not the game. We have to get out of here. Lena rushed over and took Elise by the hand. Now her look wasn't that, uh, wasn't that concerned, annoyed look, but it was a look of sheer terror. Like she was worried her sister's brain was broken. Hey, hey sit down. I'll press the panic button, okay? You, you can leave. It's fine. No, we all have to leave, Elise insisted, trying to wrestle out of her sister's grasp. We all have to. Then she heard the sound of the music box playing. Except it wasn't playing any music she knew. It was glitchier. Guys, Nora said, there's something on the screen. What does game over mean? Oh. We didn't finish it. They all turned to the screen and blood red letters on it now read game over. And then it was quickly replaced by another message. Similarly glitchy. Thanks for playing. The game has now ended. So we're free to go, Aaron said. The message glitched again. You were never free to go. Did you think this was all a game? Stop it, Elise yelled, even though she knew with a sinking feeling in her stomach that this was exactly what she'd expected. That some part of her knew there was something weird waiting for her here. For all of them, she screamed, we don't want to play anymore. I've been watching you, Elise. Nothing was a coincidence. What the fuck, Lena said, clearly terrified now as well. Stop it, okay? We want our money back. This isn't fucking cool. The message changed again. Scream all you want. They can't hear you. No, 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 L Lena whimpered. No, it's all part of the game. It's all part of the game. It has to be. She fumbled and hit the panic button. But nothing happened. The door stayed locked. The message changed again. Stay here forever. Don't you both want to see your mother again? What the fuck? Lena screamed, and Elise saw her face was now splattered with blood. Blood that couldn't have come from anywhere. Blood that was fresh. And she felt the same blood in her own hands, warm and wet. The pounding sound of someone walking with heavy footsteps and dragging an axe returned from the very beginning of the game, only much louder this time, shaking the whole room. Elise closed her eyes and braced for the feeling of metal slicing through skin and bone, and then it didn't come. She opened her eyes and saw a dim figure, shadowy but recognizable as a woman in her fifties with a head wound, standing in the middle of the room. Her mother. Elise's eyes met the figures and the mom gave a tiny nod and what looked to Elise like a sad smile and then she vanished. And then the light slowly came on and the door popped open. Elise grabbed her sister with one hand and Nora with the other, hauled them out of the room. Though the facility had been populated with people just minutes before, they'd all vanished. Now it looked like the building hadn't been used in years. A thick layer of dust over everything, cobwebs in the windows. But Elise didn't want to think about all that. She only focused on getting her family. Because Nora and Aaron were her family, and especially Lena, in the car. And then an hour later, and Aaron, as Aaron had predicted, they did end up drinking away their fears. They talked about what happened for hours, hoping to make sense of it all. But the more they shared, the less sense it made. The more real and terrifying they all felt. They tried to drink their fears away many nights the next several weeks. Elise and Nora ended up moving in together, just so they wouldn't have to live alone. Lena and Elise never went to another escape room. Elise tried to check the website she'd seen for the escape room company, couldn't find it. It had vanished. It wasn't down, not malfunctioning. It entirely vanished as if it had never been there to begin with. She didn't want to drive by the building again to see if the company was still running. Neither did her sister or Nora or Aaron. None of them wanted any more proof that what had happened to them was all too real. They'd soon consult with a psychic who would tell her and her sister that while she couldn't say for sure, it was a possibility that somehow the powerful anger and grief they'd felt after their mother's death had made them more susceptible somehow to some kind of demonic torment. She said that the best thing they could do for themselves was to grieve and then move on, stop feeling so angry towards God, not live in the past. Elise thought all this sounded crazy. People were angry with God all the time. People grieved tremendously all the time. And they weren't then feeling blood splattered on them or seeing their dead mother being touched by spirits or monsters in an escape room. But who knows? Maybe they just got really unlucky. Cross past the wrong monster, demon, whatever, at the wrong time. I mean, why do so few people get possessed by demons if they're around us all the time? Maybe experiencing what they experienced 
Maybe it was like hitting the paranormal lottery, except they lost. Whatever it was, it seemed to be over. Within just over a month of their ordeal, Elise had a stroke of good luck. She got a permanent job that paid well that she actually liked, made a couple of new work friends, even suddenly got some money from a refund that she'd given up on ever getting. Things really turned around, and she felt good. Mostly. When her mind wasn't pulled back to that night, she felt good, which sadly was pretty often. She can't close any of the doors in her apartment anymore. She doesn't like to feel locked in or anything close to trapped now. She wonders if whatever she encountered that night could trap her in an escape room. Where else could it trap her? Where else could she find herself in a room with something that wants nothing more than to absolutely terrify her? Something that wants her to stay with it forever. She still worries it can return at any moment. At any moment, maybe she'll hear the pounding footsteps, the dragging axe, and this time it'll strike. <laughs> that is so creepy. Is that scenario? Oh my God. I, and I think it is a movie. I think there is an escape room movie. There must be. There must be. Oh, yeah. And speaking of horror movies, apparently, uh, I should address. Uh, we got a lot of emails. <laughs> Ethan Hawke has been in the Sinister movies. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. I forgot Ethan Hawke's been in other horror movies. And also, um, it is um, Zach Bagans, I oh, think. And I call oh. him Baggins. Oh, how dare you? I don't, I don't want, I'll be honest. I don't watch his show. <laughs> I have like a little fit out here every time you say it. My, yeah. eye, my eye twitches. <laughs> oh, in Saw, I mean, saw, every Saw movie is an escape room. Kind of. Yeah. So, I mean, that theory's kind of there. True. Yeah. True. That's true. And I think there there might even be a horror movie called Escape Room. It feels, I, I, it feels not, oddly familiar yeah. to me. I have to burp. I'm sorry. Yeah, I haven't watched any uh, movies set that way, but it, but yeah, what, what a great... If, if there isn't a movie about it set in an escape room, there should be. Because what a great setting for a horror movie. Oh, my God. What a great setting. And, and there is a lot of intense... I didn't really know about it. I've never done the horror escape rooms. Oh, me either. Around the world, there's some like really intense ones that are like 18 plus. You got to sign waivers and things. Fuck that. Where like people pop in and out of the rooms like it gets like crazy. Nope. I have some pictures. I am not interested in that kind. <laughs> uh, be because I would be so scared afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Even, though, even if the character Great or concept. like the, the person would have to come out and like take their mask off or introduce them and be like, hey... I'm Jeremy. I'm like, oh, okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. You know, because like I couldn't. Joe, you've done an escape rooms, but have you done a horror one before? I haven't. But the thought of being in a really good haunted house that they don't let you leave yeah. does scare me. Yeah. It makes me so uncomfortable. Because you know, like in escape rooms where you have to like sometimes like reach your hands like oh, into the God. wall. Yeah, and it's like dark. Yep, and, it's dark. What if you do that and then somebody grabs your arm and pulls it, you know, like that? I mean, yeah. God. Or somebody like pops up in the mirror. Yeek. Um, I have some pics. <sighs> This one, I don't think it's current, but a couple years ago from Madison, Wisconsin, from World of Escapes, it's called Eat or Be Eaten. I mean, that is like a Saw room. Yeah, that's like Saw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eat or Be Eaten. That's that one called Eat or Be Eaten. Um, this next one uh, used to be in Toronto. This was one of those 18 plus ones Oof. called The Unknown. No way. <laughs> um, couldn't figure out what this next one is called. It's in Ontario, Canada. This came up on a on a. Uh, there's a picture of it in a list of My escape rooms. My God, what's yeah. going on in Canada? The end is near. And then uh, one more. This is Monterey, California, called Masquerade Manor by Exodus Escape Room. And I can just, just picture people like popping in and out of that one. Oh, well, I, I was thinking that that masquerade mask alone hanging on the wall is enough. Like, I don't need any additional scary things. That Ooh. thing is freaking creepy. Put, put some like a real face. Like if it was hollowed on the other side oh, so God. the eyes could actually watch you. You can do so many like horrible things in a horror escape room. I think that if everything falls apart in your life, you could go be the voice of a very scary escape room. And I think you would love it. That would be pretty fun. It would be a pretty fun job. What putting, that, putting one together would be so fun. It would. It would. Like, it would it, be great. Uh, oh. Okay. Well, maybe. Okay. Let's see how summer camp goes this year. <laughs> but maybe next year we can have. An I don't know. Room. Maybe. 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 We'll have to because see like liability be, all that. Well, there has to be like a portable escape room. True. Because you always go to a building, but God, somebody fun. somebody has got to have come up with that concept. Because it's it's just taking the murder mystery dinner to another uh -huh. level. I, I would love, I mean, it'd be so fun to do that if you had cameras in there. Oh my God. And then to be able to make clips afterwards of people losing their shit. Like, I, will, I, I know I, would, I, brought I would cry. Up, oh, I know I brought it up on the show before, but it's been a little while. If you're like a new creep or peeper. It's, it's like if you do like Japanese hidden camera pranks, specifically, I don't know what was going on in Japan for a while. I don't know if they can still do it, mm -hmm. but the laws were clearly more relaxed there, at least for a while when it came to what you could get away with. I mean, the most brutal pranks, and it doesn't seem like the people are in on it, like they're, like they're actors. Yeah. I mean, just one that was funny 
<laughs> but it is so crazy that I'll never forget was people go in this elevator. I think Joe's seen all these too. But people go in this elevator and there was this, and there was a trap door in the elevator that, that sends you on a long slide. Like it was so complex and shoots you out in this horrible looking cellar place. Get the fuck out. And there was this lady. It's, oh my God, like this lady in this business suit. And she walks in the elevator. She screams when she falls through the trap door. Of course she does. By the time she makes it into the basement by the, in the slide, she's sobbing. Like she's, yeah. <laughs> she's so scared. And then the scariest one though. I love that you think that's funny. <laughs> when I it's find somebody no- else. When it's somebody nope. else. <laughs> and then the, the um the scariest one was they had the the setup was actors coming in for an audition. Like you're coming, this is the waiting room. There was like mirrors on the wall, you know, get your makeup right and everything, and then you go into this audition. And you have just one person at a time. And then they would have the the mirrors were fake mirrors, and they would have the the girl that like the girl from the ring, mm. like that kind of dark oh, hair. I think you told me about this. Horrible. She would pop up in the mirror, and then there was some way, it's been a while since I've seen, I don't know if she came to the mirror. Or the wall next to me, but I think was able to come through the mirror. Well, I don't know what they made it out of, but she fucking bursts through the wall into I think, the room. I think you showed me this. And this one guy <laughs> was in there. Like, he like flipped out of his chair, and it was like an animal when an animal's fighting for its life, and it just panicked. He was there was just so much terror, and he was like trying to hide, and she kept chasing him around the room. He had to have shit his pants. Like he was so scared. I mean, that's almost funnier. And like I can see the humor in that because the uh, elevator shaft thing. Yeah, that I, was intense. I, exactly, like it's too far. Oh, the farthest one I've seen, and this was a, this is why I think there must be different laws. Uh, I don't know. I'm assuming it's still on YouTube. It's been years since I looked for it, but I will never forget this either. I don't know the, the amount of money they spent to make this work, but it was some uh, ski resort mm-hmm. in Japan, and there was like a, a little cabin in one part where you would like get massages. <laughs> Okay. So some like little like cabin where you're supposed to get massages and you and so you get naked except for a towel and you sit on one of these chairs like a oh, massage. Oh boy. Like it was like a chair that could fold down to a flat bed. And this is so insane to me they did this. The fuck like you'd be facing the center of the room, the wall behind you would open up. They would like you cl- close your eyes, you put a little thing or like your towel yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It spins your chair around and then it shoots you out the wall. You're on the bed and there's like a rocket. It's on this. It's like it's like a sled. What? Like it converts into a sled, and suddenly you're naked on a little massage bed, <laughs> <laughs> being, being shot down a ski hill. Just that imagery is hilarious. Oh my god! People are like scrambling like they're butt naked. Yeah, and freezing and cold. Freezing and scared. They're gonna fall off. Like they're going really fast. It looks so dangerous. Have you seen the one where they put the porta potty next to the lake? And no. They, so you're sitting down, going to the bathroom, and then all of a sudden you're just floating out to the lake, and they're pulling you behind a boat. <laughs> Okay, that's actually funny. Oh, God. I can get behind things that are actually funny, but when you're petrified, it's just, I don't know. I love watching people being terrified. Oh, boy. Remember the time you scared me and I cried? (laughs) Yes, I'll never forget that because you'd made a weird little series of squeaks and then just started crying and then apologized for crying. Like, it it all happened within like three seconds. It was such a weird sequence of events. (laughs) (sighs) (sighs) Oh, boy. Okay, escape rooms. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if you have anything, or we can we can move on to the next story. I mean, it, it is such a great concept, and it is such yeah. a great setting for a place to be scared. Yeah. Okay. So when Kyler turned eleven, twelve, I don't even remember, but for like two or three years in a row, all he wanted oh, to do for his birthday rooms. was escape rooms, mm-hmm. and so it was like okay. And the way that we share birthdays is that we alternate years. You know, like yeah. you've got evens, we've got odds for this kid. You've yeah, got with, uh, opposite with, uh, their mom and stepdad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was his mom and stepdad's turn to plan. And she Uh was like, okay, we're going to go to this escape room, blah, 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 blah. And then we were like, well, what are we all going to do, the four parents, for an hour to an hour and a half while these dingbats are in here? And then we were like, well, should we do one? Like, we just didn't know what else to do. Because you can't leave and come back because you're, you know, you're watching other people's kids. And so I remember now it was a very tiny escape room. The the (laughs) four of us are like smashed in there. Heather and I aren't very big people, but you and Eric are like big dudes. Yeah. And it was like a camping thing. And so it started, I, oh, I'll remember this for as long as I live. Because my girlfriends were like, you're doing an escape room with who? <laughs> Tell me more. Uh, but it was like, you were you had to set up camp and as the day, as the hour, but as yeah, the, the day sun, went, sun the setting. sun was setting. But, 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 we did beat it. We did win mm-hmm. at the very end. And it was pretty impressive to watch the four of us do yeah, it. Yeah, we did but, pretty well together. Yeah, yeah. Like weirdly so, but... 
Boy, was that something. <laughs> Boy, was that something. All right. Are you ready to move on to a mysterious disappearance and creepy reappearance? As much as I love that first story, and it's one of my favorite ones in a while, this next one is another one where I'm just like, oh, I wish I, I don't like that. I know. I'm I very like uncomfortable saying. about this escape room. And then I kept seeing like weird shadow things in here. I was kind of like, I was so dicey. Well, this next story is very creepy too. Okay. Just a bit of setup on this one. Uh, here on Scared to Death, we have now covered many stories of mysterious disappearances. Stories about people who vanished seemingly into thin air, leaving behind few, if any, clues as to what had happened to them in their last known moments. Last moments that were probably frightening, strange, if not downright horrifying. With these stories, it's easy to think that if the vanished person simply reappeared, they'd have a reasonable explanation for what had happened and everyone would be able to set their minds at ease. But what if that is not true? What if their reappearance makes their original disappearance all the more unsettling? After hearing the following story, you might wish that Linda Artiaga had simply just vanished forever. That way, we wouldn't have to hear about what she said she saw after she disappeared in 2012. Time now for the tale of Lost in the Land of Shadows. On September 22nd, 2012, 53-year-old Linda Artiaga decided to go on a hike with her 56-year-old brother, Eddie Huff, in the Arkansas Ozarks. Excuse me, Ozarks, near the tiny, roughly 200 piece in 200 person town of St. Joe, halfway between Springfield, Missouri, and Little Rock, Arkansas. Linda and Eddie had been visiting family in St. Joe when, like many of us do, they decided to escape for a little time for themselves. They decided to go and find a fishing hole that Eddie had heard about. It felt like a totally normal Saturday for Linda and Eddie. At least it started out that way. And then it would become anything but. After leaving to find that fishing spot, over two days passed without anyone hearing a word from either Linda or Eddie. Finally, on Monday, Eddie came out of the woods alone. Friends and family tried not to think the worst that Eddie had done something to mm -hmm. Linda in the woods or that they'd both run into someone with less than good intentions and Eddie was covering for some reason. Eddie told everyone they'd become separated somehow and that Linda may have been injured. That read to many as suspicious. Despite the heavily wooded valleys, rivers, and pasture land of that area of the Ozarks, the hiking trail that Linda and, Linda and Joe had been following was well marked, making it nearly impossible to deviate from the path. As three days turned into four without any clues of where Linda might be or what may have happened to her, people started to lose hope that they'd ever find her, alive at least. Over a hundred volunteers combed the woods on Tuesday and Wednesday found no trace of her. <sighs> then, almost a week after she vanished, Linda reappeared. And what a tale she would have to tell. On Thursday, an all-terrain vehicle found Linda two miles from where she'd been last seen. The searcher took Linda to search headquarters, where the Searcy County Sheriff then had an ambulance take her to the hospital. Linda, despite her harrowing ordeal, seemed to be in good overall condition, with only cuts and bruises. Well, she seemed to be in good physical condition. Mentally, maybe not so much. As Chief Deputy Dwayne Pierce would say, she wasn't quite about her head. What exactly did that mean? meant that after Linda told the police what she thought had happened to her during her five-day ordeal, they thought she was crazy. Mm -hmm. To be fair to them, that was about the only rational explanation based on what she was saying. Linda said that she'd been wearing a t-shirt, jeans, and flip-flops when she began her hike. Eddie would confirm that. She said she had no idea how she'd gotten separated from Eddie. One, one moment, she was hiking with him, dressed as she'd just been described, and then the next, she was opening her eyes as if she'd been asleep or unconscious, and now she found herself alone and shoeless. It was like her memory had simply shorted out. She had no idea where Eddie was. She assumed somewhere back down the trail, she was worried he'd been hurt somehow. She then told police that while trying to find her uh, some help for Eddie, or her, just to find Eddie, she came across some other hikers. At first she was relieved to find them, but then she quickly realized there was something wrong with them. When Linda called out to them, they acted like they didn't hear her. She screamed and yelled, but they never even turned around, never reacted in any way. It was like she was completely invisible, unable to be heard. Later, she would wonder if those hikers had been of this world, or if they were of this world, if somehow she was no longer of this world. She kept walking, kept searching for Eddie, or someone to help Eddie. As her surreal night wore on, Linda began to see another strange sight. As she stumbled through the brush, she saw several shadowy figures who seemed to be hiding from her in the woods. They were always close, Right or never close, not that close, always in the distance, always watching. Just around Ben, she'd catch a glimpse of a hand or a head and then see it slink back behind a tree trunk. Sometimes she'd lose sight of these shadowy figures for several minutes, but she knew they were still close by. She could feel them, feel their eyes watching her, and then they would reappear. She would say about them, these people were hiding in bushes. They were weird people, very weird people. 
Dr. John Sorg of North Arkansas Medical Center, who examined her after she'd been found, said it was possible that Linda could have ingested some kind of berry or toxic substance that made her hallucinate. However, he also said that this didn't seem like a hallucination to him. He said that her story was always consistent and that she seemed very oriented and appropriate in conversation. In short, he didn't think Linda was necessarily hallucinating when, when she saw those shadowy figures in the woods. And other researchers have pointed to similar tales to show that Linda's experience, terrifyingly, may incredibly not be all that unique. Over the past several decades, there have been other women who've gotten lost in those woods only to later report after they've been found that they were followed, even chased, by what they described as not-quite-men. And all of the cases of women reporting being chased in the woods that we can find have either occurred in the region from where Linda was lost, or from further east along the Appalachian Trail. If all these stories are true, Linda should feel lucky that she made it out alive, that the figure she saw those nights only watched her. What about all the other women who've gone missing in the Ozarks or in the forests of Appalachia? Over the past several decades, hundreds and hundreds of hikers have disappeared and never reappeared, last seen wandering in somewhere in America's forests. How many of them were also watched by those shadowy figures that Linda and others said watched them? How many ended up finding themselves in their final moments experiencing being much more than watched by whatever those things are? Did you ever see Kiss the Girls? No. Oh my God. Joe, did you see Kiss the Girls? Man, it sounds familiar. I'm not sure. It's like around like the Hannibal Hannibal Lecter era. Okay. Uh, not Jody. Yeah, uh, not Jody Foster. Um, Winona. Ryder. Uh, Winona. No. Judd. Judd. Winona Judd. Right. Thin brown hair, really pretty. Am I thinking of the Ash, right? Ashley, Ashley Judd. Judd. Yes, I was mm-hmm. like one of the Judds. Uh, maybe Morgan Freeman. It's like where he's mm-hmm. a detective and she maybe is also a detective, but there's like this weird serial killer, and but he only abducts young, beautiful, incredibly talented women. So he has like a, a violinist that he's captured. He has maybe like a pre-med student and he's keeping them in this like basement dugout cellar situation. It's so creepy. I think he calls himself Casanova. It is such a creepy creepy, creepy, true mm, crime yeah. m- movie, but she gets out and she r- makes a run for it in the woods. And so like, just like, in, you know, when you can put a picture to yeah, something, yeah. even whether, whether it's from a movie or from mm-hmm. your real life, it's just like this image of being in the woods, in the dark, barefoot, running, yeah. something coming after you that you don't entirely know what the enemy is. That alone is so scary. And then for so much time to have elapsed, this isn't yeah. like she disappeared on Monday and was like, disappeared but like let's just say she like got lost yeah you no know, she disappeared she was like five days gone. it reminded me of stranger things so crazy so much time loss i don't like gaps in time that freaks me out it reminded me of the upside down mm-hmm. are but, we gonna watch the new season yeah okay. i'm going to yeah i want to okay. watch it okay. um but uh yeah like where like you know you can that that weird detail of her yelling at those other hikers who look yeah. totally normal and then yeah. just not reacting at all uh-huh reminded me of stranger things where you can be in the upside down and it's just like layered over this world and so you can see people or you know hear them mm-hmm. but you can't you can't connect cuz you're just like some like uh, like a fissure. dimensional yeah. dimensional like uh, difference you know yeah. like one Glitch dimension in the la- yeah layered over the other yeah oh. how crazy is that like what if you could like slip into some alternate un- parallel parallel universes i yeah. think this is the term i was trying to think but like i don't know that's not even necessarily true but maybe i don't know i can't remember what you'd call it right now if it's a parallel universe you know i think that's part of the multiverse you can say that or just like some other dimension where you're here still mm-hmm, still mm-hmm. but no one but you're not like you're not in the right here like you can see everybody uh-huh, but they can't uh-huh, see uh-huh. you and and then what if in that place just like the upside down there's like there's these fucking creepy monster things right 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 <clears throat> and i will say thank god she was only gone for a week because her poor brother i'm sure oh everyone my god. Is Everyone's like, like you killed her you killed her How you, terrible right oh and if she would have been gone longer or never come back g- guaranteed he's on trial yeah or, yeah. or or his entire life is ruined because right, his, his family, reputation is ruined. Uh, his family doesn't, even though like you know and love and trust this person, yeah. you don't believe him, or you're always like having this lingering moment or this lingering thought of like what happened in that moment when Eddie, you know, was in the woods with Linda. Oh man. Well that reminds I, I'm glad she came back. That reminds me of something else we're watching, and, I, and we're not gonna give any spoilers, but there was the staircase documentary, oh, which I watched so good a couple years ago. And now there is the staircase, also called the staircase, but like uh, a recreation basically of the of elements from the documentary what? about this author Michael I can't even think of his last name no, I can't remember either but it's a Colin Tony Collette's in it oh, Colin Tony, Firth I love not Colin Firth yeah uh, Colin Firth oh yeah 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 I was thinking of Colin uh, Farrell 
Farrow. But it's Colin Firth. Yeah, Colin Firth. But, but Tony Collette, I She's love her. Great. She is such an incredible, multifaceted mm-hmm. actress. She can be so beautiful. She mm-hmm. can take it down and be really like raw and just plain. Yeah. Because not ugly. She's not ugly. It's like not that. I don't know how to explain it where she just, it's like. It's a it's very like, versatile look. Yeah. It's almost, it's like, reminds me kind of like Meryl Streep can do this too, where it's mm-hmm. just like, you can see them as a very sexual person. You can see them as like a very beautiful, um, even like maternal type figure, or you can yeah. see them in like a really ugly, like, oh, you give me the heebie-jeebies. Reminds me of the lead from Handmaid's Tale. I can never remember her name. Elizabeth Moss. Elizabeth Moss. Mm-hmm. She can look um, very pretty. Yes. And then, and then like a uh, dress her different, different facial expressions. I think she can be kind of unattractive. Yeah, you know? it's, it's but, not but it's, ugly. It's like it's almost like you can feel the ugly inside of them, like yeah. like an ugly character. Such an amazing uh, thing that certain actors can do. Ugh. But but that show that but the staircase. Yes, sorry. Just, just the concept without spoiling it, uh, without giving anything away, is just you know what if somebody died in your life mm-hmm. in a suspicious way, mm-hmm. but you didn't do it, but you couldn't prove that you didn't do it, and your whole life was destroyed. Right. Upside you go, down. You, you go to prison. Whoa. I mean, I mean, there's those things that people going to prison for, you know, uh, uh, crimes they didn't commit mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. so terrible. But then to add another layer to that, what if the crime was like, you know, people think you killed like, yeah, your sibling or your wife. Or your husband, something well, like that. You'd be screwed. If I died in a questionable <laughs> manner, you looking like you. Oh, I know. It doesn't matter how many times I've told my friends, like, he's so sweet. He's so nice. He's a big teddy bear. I know. I'd Public be opinion would not be great on you. I know. I don't have a good face for that. Or tattoos. I know. I know. You're your Next. own worst enemy. Oh, geez. I love it, though. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, listen, like, guys, if I die in a suspicious manner, you heard it here. Dan didn't do it. I know I know you wouldn't even mean it this way, but that is a funny thing. It's like, what do they call it, like a backhanded compliment? But it's like, where it's like, listen, <laughs> I want you to know, I find you very attractive. I think you're a sexy guy. Now, most of the world <laughs> finds you to be a creepy troll. No! Finds you to be a little bit of a monster who should live under a bridge. No, 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 I know, I said you didn't mean it that way. I did not mean that way. I just mean like in the context of the court of public opinion, you would be in a wee bit of trouble. I know. We could soften you up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. But yeah, what a what a terrifying thing to just be like. I, I was thinking in that story, uh, you know, like a couple Father's Days ago, during the height of COVID, we took your stepdad fishing out at Winchester yeah. Lake. Yeah. And like that would just be such an easy place to run off and go for a little hike. And then if only one <sighs> person came back, mm-hmm. that's very uncomfortable. Like, what do you even do? Yeah. Ugh. Well, thanks for coming back, Linda. Ooh. Kind of. Pictures. Oh, sure. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. We got to talk in. Good job. Good job, Joe. Keeping the oh, train on the tracks. Joe. Um, yes, this first picture is uh, Linda. It's, it's not a great picture, but it's the is only one. Is she in the red shirt? Yep. She's okay. the, so that's right after yeah. they found her. Gatorade. You know, yeah, yeah. Getting her, uh, uh, what is it? Her electrolytes. electrolytes back. And that's um, Sheriff Kenny Castle and some others who helped find her. And then this next picture is just a, a rough overview of the area she was lost in. You know, it's a lot of, a lot of a, woods to search. a lot of woods. And very dense, very thick foliage. And then this last one, this is a little gift that I found that I'm like, I can't believe how perfectly that fits with this story. Okay. It's not from this story, but like, this is what I imagine her seeing when she's out in the woods. <sighs> oh. This is like, oh, this little creepy guys. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, they multiply. Mm-hmm. See, they're all over the place. Yee, 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 yee. Uh, my hair brushed against my shoulder. I was like, oh, my God, who's here? <laughs> it's me. It's me and my hair. It's me. Oh, uh, man. I also did make a note that when you were in Springfield, Missouri just uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. I freaking love Springfield, Missouri. It was so dang cute. Did we already talk about this? I think we did last episode because it was. it's a very, very cute downtown. Very cute. And like, like, like preposterously. And I just want to say, I was so surprised and so impressed in a town that size, the diversity of that town, mm-hmm. of color, creed, sexual preference, yeah. just, and then beyond that, like options of food, shopping. It, so much. I couldn't believe it. I was like, where am I? Yeah. yeah. Good job, Springfield, Missouri. Good <laughs> job. Whew. Okay. The escape room is still really like sitting in my chest. I feel, it, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's so uncomfortable. I don't care for it. All right. Well, let's get into my half of the show. Okay. Uh, okay. So as I indicated, what's going on over there? Just had a little fuzzy. <laughs> oh, I thought, oh my God. Wait, can I tell you one quick thing? No. Okay. It's not time. Okay. Thank um, you. 
So as I indicated before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is it? Uh, so I, my girlfriends and I, Marco Polo, and today I was poloing the girls on my way back from my workout. Yeah, and, and, and if you don't know what Marco Polo is, it's a, it's a little like you make a little video message, just a little video of yourself, yeah. and then immediately send it to whoever, whatever friend you want. Yeah, like Marco Polo, get it? Okay. Yeah. There was an orb floating in my car, and I, it was, I need to go back and watch it because I was polling with them, and then I was like, you guys, is there a fucking orb like floating back here? Because like my phone's like mounted, whatever. Yeah. Stop it. No, I'm not oh. trying to look at it. Now you're spooking me out. Oh, no. But it was in the car. Okay. So I was like, oh my God. What is so I need to go back and look. But there was a little white something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ichiwawa. All right. Well, no. I'm not, now that I've got that out of my head, uh, creepy little kid stuff. Kids are inherently creepy. I think that we can all agree <laughs> on that. Like just the things that they say out of context, you know, mm-hmm. little stingers. <laughs> uh, yeah. And and so this this story i would say it's not the scariest but definitely very creepy okay uh and this little kid like i don't know like they supposedly have an imaginary friend but then they predict some weird things that's very very odd Mm -hmm. i mean i don't know and it's like i i'm supportive of kids having imaginary friends you know it's like a piece of your imagination development of your brain that's fine or like i don't know maybe you do see something but when they start to predict things that's a whole other thing, yeah. That's a whole other level of creepy. Because what is that called? Premonition? Mm-hmm. Some psychic ability? Oof. I know. People say like, oh, deja vu. I've got this weird feeling. It's like, or you're psychic. Eek. Eek. All right, well, let's find out what is going on with this little imaginary person. Hey, Lindsay and Dan. Dan's been my favorite comedian for years now. I started listening to Time Thank you. Suck. And then Spotify suggested the Scared to Death podcast. Yes. And I immediately got hooked and petrified. I'm definitely a peeper, and when my boyfriend gets home at late, he scares me all the time now. (laughs) My story is about when my family lived in an eastern town in North Carolina when I was just barely three years old. I've grown up with the retelling of uh, of this memory by my mom my whole life, and no detail has ever changed. She has never been a superstitious person or into spirits at all, for that matter. However, this one house we lived in, she knew had spirits based on all of the things that happened in it, specifically with me. We often moved to new states as my dad was an electrical contractor and traveled for work very often. He'd only live with us for a couple months and then moved to a new place right away to find work. Hmm. This often left my mom alone, raising us on her own the majority of the time. And while she loved getting to be a stay-at-home mom, we were absolute hellions. We kept her running and exhausted every single day. When we moved to Edenton, North Carolina back in 1994, I was roughly three years old, my sister was seven, and my younger brother was just one and a half. The dirt road leading to the 150-year-old house we were renting was a dead end. It was a two-story home with a large fireplace in the main living area, a few headstones out back dating to the Civil War area, and a couple of large pecan trees. We unpacked a few things upon arriving at the house, but we were exhausted from our drive from Oklahoma. As soon as everyone had settled into bed for the night, I went running into my parents' room yelling, There's a boy on my dresser! (laughs) My parents believed, as any adult might, that it was just a small child's imagination running wild and influenced by their new environment. My mom led me by my hand back to my room. As she opened the door, she saw the outline of a young boy. He disappeared in a split mm. second, but my mom had seen enough to shock her and that and to shock her that I had been telling the truth. My mom, too tired to deal with disappearing boys after a long day and another move, just had me sleep with her and my dad for the night. As time marched on, my mom began to notice small things popping up in random places that they weren't in before, or she'd come home to find furniture had been rearranged. To this day, she still says if she hadn't been so exhausted from raising three small energetic children and moving our family around, mostly by herself, that she might have felt more scared, but she was just too damn tired. That's funny. I often talked about the boy from the first night. My mom would hear me talking to him all the time at all hours of the day about random things. She got the sense that it was more than just an imaginary friend when I began to discuss things most three-year-olds generally don't know much about. My mom very clearly remembers a time when the boy and I had a conversation about Buenes. Her, (laughs) that's how it's written, Buenes. Her, unsure of what I was talking about, asked for clarification, and I knocked on my head and said, you know, Buenes, indicating brains. (laughs) Over time, I let my mom know that the boy's name was Dennis, and that he had died playing by the large fireplace in the house because that was what he had told me. 
Dennis and I would also talk about our intestables, also our intestines, <laughs> and death, and so much so, and not so much as the looming planning of someone's death, but rather as a child's morbid sense of curiosity. There were other people in the house that I could see and interact with, too. One time, I gestured to, gestured to an empty playroom and said, everybody wants to play, while describing a man with a hole in his head whose brains I could see. Oh my God. There was also a woman who would occasionally show up but they were never as active as Dennis was. Dennis would often be a little mischievous, but only like any little boy would be. He would move things around, turn lights on and off, and open and close doors. Everyone was witness to this activity at some point or another. One evening in particular stands out when Dennis made himself known. We were getting home late from something and a huge thunderstorm had hit. My mom's hands were full with three kids to lug in and not an extra hand to unlock the door. She called out to Dennis to lend her a hand and the door unlocked for her right away and then she thanked him for it. What? There was even a time that we were running late and he had hidden my mom's keys. Too tired to deal with his shit that day, she yelled, Dennis, I'm going to count to three and my keys better show up. She closed her eyes, counted to three, and sure enough, when she looked at the once empty coffee table, they now held her keys. What? We did get confirmation that Dennis was not just a figment of our imagination one night when we were out to dinner. We were at a local restaurant, and it being a relatively small town, the kind waitress asked us if we were new in town. My mom mentioned moving into the old house and how it was good, but could get a little weird at times. And without being further prompted, the woman said, oh, Dennis, huh? What? Turns out, he was a relatively common uh, character to the locals, but the general consensus was that, while a bit spooky, he was entirely harmless. There was only one instance that really scared my mom. One day, all of the toys in our room on the second floor were somehow outside on the roof, just outside of the window of the toy room. This upset my mom so much because someone could have been seriously hurt either putting the toys out there or bringing them back in. My mom accused my sister at first, uh, my mom accused my sister at first as it couldn't have been me or my brother since we weren't strong enough to open the window. My sister told my mom it wasn't her and that it was Dennis who did it. My sister was the kind of kid that never would have been that naughty. Plus, she would have gotten her dress dirty if she had done that and she was not about that life. My mom scolded Dennis and then he moved everything back into our room. Around this time, I would occasionally say some pretty creepy and seemingly prophetic stuff to my mom. On a pleasant day, we were playing outside, and my mom was sitting at the base of one of the pecan trees watching us play in the yard. I walked over to her and told her she couldn't sit there anymore. She asked why, and I replied saying that a snake would come down from the sky and bite her, and she would fly out of her neck up to heaven, and then she wouldn't be my mommy no more. My, my mom, thinking that was straight up creepy, decided mm -hmm. to get up and get us all something to drink. As she made her way from the tree to the house, a huge snake fell from the tree and plopped to the ground right where she had been sitting. Obviously, this was creepy as fuck, and while she thought it was weird how I could predict this event, she shrugged it off and tried not to think about it. A few weeks later, my mom was heading out to the store while we stayed home with my dad. I stopped her before she went and told her to drive super duper slow or else her car, her car would fall over and she would fly out of her neck and she wouldn't be my mommy no more. <laughs> After the snake incident, my mom took the sharp corners to town three miles an hour. She was not about to test the creepy shit her daughter had told her. What I didn't know at the time was that when I was an, when I was an infant, my mom had been in a car accident that broke her back. The idea of me suggesting her dying in a car accident freaked her out beyond belief. She never would take that turn over five miles an hour ever again. We moved to eight different states and over 12 Man. different towns since then. My mom has never talked about ghosts or hauntings in any of them, just the old house from Edenton. After moving from that house, I never saw Dennis again or any of the other invisible friends that I had had. I've been wanting to take a trip back there for many years now to see what has become of the old house and my old friend, Dennis. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Yeah, really interesting. <clears throat> just interesting, like, like uh, I mean, yes, the premonition part, uh, you know, interesting, but I found it... Uh, more interesting, I guess, just like like the multiple people, just one of those confirmation stories. Yeah, exactly. Where, you know, it wasn't just her as a little kid seeing things. It was like her mom seeing this outline, her mom starting to interact with things, like the give me the keys back. I know, that's pretty funny. Pretty funny. And then going to the restaurant and having somebody like reference the spirit by name. Yeah. Is, I mean, God, 
I mean, how do you deny it at how, that point? Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're one of the people, I mean, obviously, if you're just hearing the story, you can be like, well, whoever wrote this in just made it all up. That, sure. That's how you can. I mean, with any of these stories. But if you're in this story. And yeah. you, you're the mom in the story. I mean, you absolutely have to believe in the paranormal for the rest of your life. There's no other explanation. Well, what's kind of funny is that it sounds like her mom doesn't or his mom. Like, it just sounds like there is no belief. Well, and she just is kind of like, oh, whatever. I was too tired to deal with it. I was too tired to be scared. And now, like, you know, all these years later, meh. Funny. Just how we can rationalize things, I guess. I, uh, well, I did. I, if you give into it. I know. Maybe. Just, yeah. And, and I feel like, and, and I'm one of these people sometimes, I will try to like be super skeptical mm -hmm. because uh, as much as I want to have like hardcore proof in some moments, mm -hmm. I also know it will terrify me. Right. The alternate is probably <laughs> right, not right. something you want to live with. And I, I did like that mom that too uh, tired to be scared. Yep. That resonated so much with me where it reminded me of when we went, um, the two times we've taken surfing lessons as a family. Yeah. I, if I let my mind wander, uh -huh. I get so freaked out by dark water. True. And specifically dark ocean water because I know there's things out there somewhere that are like my worst nightmares. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like that would possibly be my least favorite death would be to be shark attacked. <gasps> or, or or some, I don't, even, I don't cool, even like though. to think about all the creepy things that It'd are out cool there. It'd be a cool story though. To, and if you're dead. Well, for, like, for me to tell, like how, oh, how oh. Did, oh, you're widowed? How did that happen? Shark attack. Shark attack. Yeah, it'd be unique. <laughs> It would be unique, and also then I would get, like, pretty tough guys. You know what I mean? Whoa. Like, it would... I just think it would be like if I was thinning the herd of potential suitors, Whoa. and they heard that my former husband was, like, this big guy, and a shark attack got him. Like, I'm not gonna not date somebody who's also, like, big, tough guy. It really plans out. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> but anyway, I when we went... I, I wasn't that scared because it's so hard. I, maybe just because I'm not in great shape, but it's so hard to paddle out and it's so hard to try and stand up on the board that like, I, I remember having thoughts on the, like paddling out where a shark would flash in my mind for a second. And I was like, I don't even care. I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted. Just go ahead and take me. Take me now. Put me out of my misery. So I thought that was, yeah, a funny little detail of hers there. Just like, whatever. Oh, that's such like Ghost, a... I don't have time for ghosts. I'm exhausted. That's an exhausted parent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three kids under what... They were like all under seven. Yeah, and by herself. Uh, mm -hmm. Right? Ooh. And like her husband is, you know, working his tail off. So right. that, you know, but like you're constantly moving and there's a lot of upheaval. And, and there's no family near you because you're uh, moving around. So you're not living by family. So yeah. it's like her just like, oh, come on, you guys. Honestly, your... if it was me and Dennis seemed entirely harmless, I'd be like, all right, Dennis, you cook dinner tonight. Dennis, like, you're... how much can you help me? <laughs> you're the babysitter, Dennis. Ba Dennis, do you do laundry? <laughs> you know, it could be a whole thing. I like uh, that story. I know. I did too. Like, again, not like super scary, but I like those little confirmations. And, and just like a little other creepy. Ones. Like yeah. the, the weird snake in the tree thing. Yeah. And then like the the car accident stuff like be careful mm -hmm. mm -mm. i do love little kids my my boy my Wayne, Wayne. uh and some of those stories i find uh okay like i love the ones that are more detailed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but i always the more detailed they are if i'm gonna be totally honest the more skeptical i will become i just like okay oh. this is a great story but but like um i'm like ah did this all happen it just feels like a horror movie i mean it, it totally could have right so sometimes the ones with less details are the ones that resonate with me longer mm. and scare me more that's fair where I'm just like, okay, this isn't some huge, big, compelling narrative, you know, you know like screen screenplay type vibe. Right. It's just something that like, ah, how do you how do you explain that mm -hmm. other than the paranormal? Because then those stories make all the other stories that much more possible. As I've said a million times, but uh, I like the constant reminder of that. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to do one Ouija board story? Yeah, it's it's not about me and Amy Winehouse either. <laughs> yeah, let's do a Ouija board story. Uh, okay. I mean, I, you've never played with a Ouija board. Is that correct? No, you don't. And you don't want me to either. Well, now I don't because now I'm old enough you to know be, better. You, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Just, oh. Okay. But if you were going to use a Ouija board, mm. what would be your purpose? Like, like, are you doing it to contact somebody um. that you miss and love? Because that, and that's what motivated me as a child is that my cousin had died very unexpectedly, very tragically. And I thought like, I wanted some sort of closure. Well, the only person I'd want to like, if I could talk to, mm -hmm. would be like my grandpa Ward. Mm -hmm. But like just his personality, it's like he would be so disappointed <laughs> in me using a Ouija board. He'd be like, "You dummy!" Like he would like make fun. Like he'd be he, like, "You want to waste your time? What, what are you Go doing? Back to work. What are you doing, dummy?" You're like yeah, yeah, like <laughs> like. So I don't think he would communicate. I don't think he would. If he's still who he is in some other place, uh -huh. he's not gonna he's not gonna mess around with that bullshit. It would <laughs> it would just be a bunch of like hippy dippy bullshit to him. <laughs> So I don't know who I... You don't, you don't think he has any lingering messages? I would just not trust that it was him. Okay, okay. That I, that I was contacting something else. And even if they could share details, because people will do that. It's like, well, share details that only you would know. 
I mean, you don't know what's on the other side. You don't know what like other entities can you, just like access what we know. You don't know if they can like waterboard a spirit into giving them information <laughs> about you so that yeah. they can then use it against you. I mean, it you could be like fucking Guantanamo Bay over there. <laughs> oh but yeah, but you don't know what they could like access. They could somehow right. like get in your. Exactly. Yeah. You don't. And you really don't know what kind of deals are being made. Like. So I think if I was going to contact something, I'd be like, all right, Damon, where, what do you got? Okay. Okay. Just because I'm like, you're gonna trick me anyway. Mm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna buy that. I'm talking to a real person, anybody. So just like, what's up? What's, what's going on there, demons? What, okay. are you, what are you doing out there? So is that would would it be correct to say that your belief is that no matter what you contact via it Ouija could board, be good. It could be good. Okay. But I just would never trust it. Okay. Okay. Too many stories of things that started off nice, and that's how they fucking get you. Well, here we go. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. You get it, Dan. This is why we're not doing Ouija boards. Although I did see on like the camp, there's a private Facebook group. I know group. I might play a Ouija board at the camp. Oh. You're sleep then you're sleeping at camp. You're not coming home with me. Um, somebody has a glow in the dark Ouija board. I was like, that's Whoa. fucking dangerous because you're in the dark camping. You're already scared. Every little sound is a little, and now you're gonna add a Ouija board to it. Yeah. Make sure you guys take video. I will not be there for that. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Greetings and salutations to the king and queen of creeps and peepers. I still consider myself a new listener to Scared to Death with only around 40 episodes <laughs> under my belt. And it's these episodes that make the day go by so fantastically fast. The two of you crack me up and some of the stories creep me out, sometimes laughing and getting chills at the same time. I've noticed that there are a ton of stories that involve Ouija boards. Well, I've got a story that started when I was a kid, probably no older than four or five years old. I grew up as an only child in Casper, Wyoming. We had a normal home with two dogs, a decent front and backyard that I spent hours playing in and drinking from the garden hose. I had the typical cowboys and Indians sheets and pillowcases. Isn't it funny how you remember some small details that don't really seem to matter, and yet the big, t big details seem to slip from our minds? Well, one big detail that I do remember from my childhood is a recurring nightmare that I had. From my bed, I could see all the way down the hallway into our living room. At the end of the hallway, you'd head into the kitchen, continue straight, and you'd go into the living room. We used to have swinging doors leading into our kitchen, like the ones at the entrance to a bar in old Western movies. Halfway down the hall, towards my room, there was a bathroom. I would always sleep with my door open as I didn't like the dark so much at that age. However, the issue wouldn't be something in my room, rather something at the end of the hallway. I remember my dad's two brothers and his sister came over to visit and have dinner one night. Being such a little guy, my bedtime came quickly, and no matter how bad I wanted to stay up with my uncles and aunt, I was soon ushered into my room and put to bed. It seemed as though I had fallen asleep when I awoke to having to use the restroom, which, oddly enough, seems to continue throughout my life. <laughs> I swung my legs off the bed to go to the bathroom halfway down the hall. My door had been pulled closed by my mother as she didn't want the noise and the lights to keep me up while my folks and our guests talked their way through the evening. By now, the house was dark and everyone seemed to have left. My folks were in bed sleeping, and I walked down the hallway to the bathroom, turned on the light, did my business, and left to go back to bed. As I turned the bathroom light off and stepped into the hallway, I felt something watching me. I looked over my shoulder into the living room and saw nothing, but I still felt it. I, it felt just dark and evil. I ran to my room, leaving the door open so I could see if anything was coming for me, as well as a way to quickly run into my parents' room if I needed to. Nothing was there. No sound. No movement. We had two miniature schnauzers, and they weren't even barking at all. In fact, everything seemed completely fine. Scared and cold, I eventually drifted off to sleep again. This time, my dreams wouldn't be about cowboys or race cars or any of the normal stuff kids dream about. Tonight would be different, and it would follow me through my life. Again, I awoke and felt an incredible dread and fear. I looked down the hallway and saw it for the first time. A dark, shadowy, hooded and cloaked figure standing at the end of the hallway. I couldn't see any eyes or a face, just blackness that seemed to absorb all the light, like looking into the deepest of pits. I was terrified, unable to cry out, almost paralyzed, but still able to move about in bed. But never was I able to leave my bed. I wanted it gone. I wanted to run into my parents' bed and hide from this thing, but I was never able to. I saw this thing coming down the hall and was gliding towards me. The dogs weren't barking and I had no idea if I was asleep or awake. I knew I needed to do something before this thing got to me. It was already to the bathroom, the halfway mark, 
and that's when I looked down at the side of my bed. On the floor, there was a box full of what I remember to be bullets. I grabbed a handful and threw them at this thing with all the strength I had. I had no gun, no other weapon around, and I sure as hell wasn't going to go fisticuffs with this thing. <laughs> the bullets flew towards it slowly enough that I could see them all. They hit it, and then a squeal slash howl erupted from under its hood, seeming to shake the house. It doubled over in pain, so it seemed. I thought that that surely awful noise would wake my folks and the dog. Nope. Nobody woke up. Nobody came to save me. It retreated to the end of the hall where it turned towards me. It then reached into a bag that I had not noticed before and began to throw bullets my way. What? I had been hit. They hurt and burned as I screamed out in pain. I looked down at my body to find blood starting to spread all over my pajamas from holes in my body, and again it started coming down the hallway towards me. I grabbed another handful of bullets and threw it at them, and then another and another, and I remember so there was so much, so much blood that it seemed to fling off my hand as I threw the bullets. The barrage hit the creature and it howled and screamed. Over and over we would battle like this. Every time I would get hit and be a bloody mess. It seemed like it had gone on for hours. I didn't know if I could keep going, but then all of a sudden I was in my mother's arms. She was holding me, telling me it would be okay. It had been just a dream. I was not covered in blood. There were no holes in me and no box of bullets next to the bed. I was terrified and crying. I would spend the rest of the night in my parents' bed and this thing, this, this beast or creature or whatever it was, didn't return that night. These dreams stuck with me pretty much, these dreams stuck with me and pretty much nightly, it seemed that they occurred, but they would eventually diminish as I aged. We moved from Wyoming about eight years later and the recurrence almost stopped, but not entirely. Every time the dream did come back, it was the same dark figure and every time we had our fight. I'd still have one of these dreams on occasion, even though I'm now in my mid forties. Now it doesn't seem to present as much of a threat as it did back then. I see it as time at times though, lurking there in the darkness, but now I'm able to tell it to leave or pay it no mind and go about my night without much fear or issue but it's still around. Everything started to tie together when I took leave from the army sometime in 2010. Most of the time I would go visit my folks in Phoenix. One night, my mother and I were up late talking. Our conversation turned to religion. My mother had always been religious. I was raised going to church every Sunday and sometimes Wednesdays as well. Today, I'm not into organized religion. I lost that belief a long time ago. However, I do believe in some sort of higher power. This conversation turned to good versus evil, and that eventually led to me asking about the Ouija board we used to have in Wyoming. My mom told me that when I was a kid, my father would use it with his brothers and sisters trying to contact their deceased mother. They would do this in the basement late at night for hours on end. My dad would say that they might have contacted her. It seemed to bring him some sort of solace or closure. They used the Ouija board in the basement right below my bedroom. I reminded my mom about my dreams again. She and I put two and two together, concluding that they must have called this evil spirit into the house. The timing of when the nightmare started with that evil cloaked shadowy figure and my dad's attempts to contact his mother relatively matched up. My mom is still mad about it to this day. I was surprised she hadn't figured it out sooner as I told her so many times about the dream. Sometimes I guess you don't see as clearly in the moment. I'm not sure where that Ouija board went, and I really don't care, so long as it's so far away from me. Thanks for reading the story, and keep on scaring and chilling us with the podcast. Thanks for all you do, Cody. Thanks, Cody. Man, uh, towards the end of that story, I was just imagining, like, um, how terrible it would be to be afflicted by something that, like, only showed up in your dreams. So, oh. like, like you're not you're not show seeing, like, ghosts or anything during the day, you know, but, like, and again, there's, like, you know, Freddy Krueger. <laughs> did the version of that in Nightmare on Elm Street where they would, you know, show up in your dreams and kill you. But what, what if it was not even that? It just like drove you insane. Like what if every time you oh fell God. asleep, some entity is waiting for you in dreamland <laughs> just to completely torment you and just torture. I mean, I mean because how can God, you, that could, it, it literally drive you insane. Well, right. Because people, you're going to tell people, I only see it when I sleep. Oh, we're well, just having bad dreams. Oh, what you, if they won't go away? Right. Nothing oh, makes them go away. Oh, you're having night terrors. Oh, you're having this. Then, then you start moving on to, you know, maybe melatonin or you take a mm -hmm. weed gummy, like something to sleep deeper and Hardcore harder. Hardcore sedatives. Right. Then you move on to like big time drugs from the doctor. And what if it None only. Of that. 
Oh, yeah. What if none of it can make it work? No matter no matter what you know you do, every time you fall, that could be another horror movie. Every oh, time you God. fall asleep, without exception, you go into a crazy nightmare world, and nothing you can do stops it. Is there a movie called Insomnia? Insomnia. Yeah, I think there is. I don't know what it's. it's I think Insomnia, but I don't know what it's about. Insomnia. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I wonder. I wonder if it has like a <clears throat> an element of that. Well, to just it. insomnia. I mean, well, insomnia is different though. Insomnia is like you can't go to sleep. No, I know. Yeah, but that. But that would. Well, you wouldn't want. You I'm, I'm saying you wouldn't want to go to sleep if every oh. time you slept you saw something terrible. Yeah. So I think that you would. I don't. I don't know how insomnia <sighs> happens. Like what? It'd be a curse. I don't know what in bleh, words, Lindsay. I don't know scientifically why insomnia starts. Like what happens chemically in the body to set yeah. that off. But I would also imagine that you can essentially make yourself an insomniac. It might not be clinically Terror, diagnosed in the yeah. same way, but like, you know, just refusing to sleep because you're afraid. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, I was thinking of Cody's little monster throwing the bullets. Like, I know. It is pretty. It's like, pretty. Know, it's like a little kid, like, you know, crazy. But also, you know, dreams are so weird that way mm -hmm. where they can be like nonsensical and mm -hmm. just kind of like silly when you describe them. But when you're in them, you couldn't be more afraid. Right, right. Well, and I mean, it started when he was eight and now yeah. he's in his mid 40s and he's still stop. occasionally having this dream. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I blame yeah. his, And of course, I'm if I'm his mom, I'm also mad. Just the timing of it. Well, yeah, like, come on. What do you think? You don't use a Ouija board in the house. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying because you don't know. I think that with yeah. Ouija boards, it is one of the most unknown things because you don't know if something is coming in right then, if it's coming and staying how do you get how did it get there how is it leaving maybe it doesn't show itself right away maybe it only shows itself to one person in its dreams like too many weird options don't know what's going on Eek. so we need to figure out how to scientifically access the paranormal side of the universe universe Ugh. and then you can just have some big like root like <laughs> i just picture like a business where it's like a wormhole or some like like thing where you can like all right you pay uh 25 dollars they give you a little list of the rules here's what it's like in the upside down and then you just get to like walk in there and be around all the monsters and everything are you like protected from them somehow Maybe you're in like a oh. tunnel and then like it's like being at an aquarium. Oh, like an aquarium, like an underground aquarium. Yeah, that's oh comforting because then they can't get me. What if they could figure that out though? But here's the thing. If they really could, if science really could prove that, you know, this other universe exists and like had really concrete data. Yeah. Wouldn't that ruin the whole lore of it that like we don't know isn't that part of what makes us scared is that we don't know what's out there i think it'd be endless though Let, let's let's just say hypothetically i don't even i mean obviously this is very hypothetically possibly impossible whatever but the science could figure out how to access some kind of dreamland nightmare world but like some kind of thing where like uh whatever people are contacting in ouija boards it's like a parallel universe it's right next to ours and they figure out how to access that mm -hmm. but then once you go into that who knows what else is there could be another layer or something else. I think the mystery is endless. Hmm. Like no matter what you access, there could be something else beyond. There's always a, a next beyond. Okay, that seems valid because I mean, like uh, we landed yeah. on, man landed on moon. Yeah. And then we keep going beyond yeah, that. Like how much further so can we go? Right, right, right. How far can we take it? And what else keep, can we see? What else can we find? And we okay. keep getting smaller, you know, as, as more powerful microscopes and things are developed. It's like, you know, the, it's that some people believe it's like you can get infinitely smaller, infinitely larger. I don't think we're ever, ever going to get rid of mystery. There's never going to be a point in humanity where it's like, well, now we got it all figured out. Fair. I don't think that'll ever happen. Well, if it does, it's not happening in our lifetime. <laughs> no, we're a long ways from that. Which is kind of fun. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do some Annabelle shout outs, Dan? Yeah. Do you want me to do it first? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Jarrett Spears. Um, Jen Deleskowitz. Thank you for the phonetic, Jen. <laughs> uh, David Haneline, or Hainline. Matthew Zacharias. Bit of Sunshine. Judy Randleman. Warrior in a Girly Shell. That's awesome. Uh, Dakota Jack, Sam and Alyssa, Eric, Deanne, Evan, Braxton, Jackson, and Mason. Taylor B. Um, uh, Alden, Abrascata. Also, thank you for the phonetic, uh, you know, breakdown. Michael and Gertie Franks, Cindy Martin, Mia Torres, uh, Arist Aristides Hernandez. Yeah, Aristides Hernandez, Heather Harper, Troye, Nikki Faust, Alex P., Tristan Rule Carter, Victoria S., Valerie Dixon, Tim Whitaker. I haven't seen that spelling. Whitaker? Well, but there's a C in there. 
It's a, it's Whitaker, but with a C, hmm. like Whitaker, Tim Whitaker, uh, Mother Truck in America, <laughs> Heather, Jennifer Simone, Jennifer Simoniak, Simone. Sim- oh my gosh, uh, these are tough ones this week. I know Simonalik, Jennifer Simonalik, um, Ian, but with an extra I, like I A I N. So I haven't seen that spelling before. So I'm like, Ian or Ian Heffington, uh, Brianna Wagner, Sarah Ishizaki Shinsato. Uh, Stephanie, maybe it's Italian, uh, Suka, Suka Millie, Suka Melli. I know that <laughs> there's, there's such a vast, I mean, I, I love like the amount of names and, um, and with first names, especially, and I always find this fascinating. It's like, there's no rules. Like you can, right. people just literally make up names, uh, all the time, you know, all the time <laughs> and curse their kids with like a lifetime of people being, you know, saying their name wrong. I remember that from like, you know, doing meet and greet signings and everything. I'm just like, wait, spelled how? They're like, I know. I know. Uh, my favorite. And then is, oddly, you did it to your own child. I know. <laughs> I didn't think Kyler would be such a curse. Kyler. Tyler? No, Kyler. He, he doesn't correct people. I love that he doesn't like. Sometimes it depends. Yeah. But a lot of times they're just like, they'll say like Tyler or Skyler and he just rolls with it. Well, because oftentimes it's like, it's the Starbucks barista. What does it well, matter? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, it's yeah. like, you know, it's not somebody that he's going to have this long interaction with. Mm-hmm. So I, I like that he can assess the situation and be like, it's not worth it. Thank God for Kyler Murray. Now we've got somebody who's, you know, Thank God. famous football player. Thank God. Getting that name out there. Whew. Can I go? Yeah. Okay. I would like to thank the following Annabelles for helping us donate to the Rainbow Railroad this month. Nick Barron, Alex Herna, Keisha Prouty, Kevin Sear, Cayman Preston, Jesse Albatrosov, Al- Al- Albatrosov. It's, it's pronounced Anderson. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth Felico, Allison, Cassidy Weaver, Zachary Decker, Marsha Montgomery, Lori, Chelsea Cooper, Rhonda Cummings, Meg Robinson, Cammie Higley, Jessica and Shayna, Nikki Morgan, Leighton Brooks, Cole A., Kamiri Ariel Catlett, Marissa Morissette, Omar, tearing it up, <laughs> but like Taryn, T-A-R-Y-N. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Nicholas Jenkins, Kate McColorado, Caitlin McGuire, Kimberly Tushim, Deandra De- Diarmas, Ashley Brown, Peyton Johnson, Jared Williams, Anthony Brinkley, Matthew Stafford, and Ashley Spiker. Thank, thank, thank all of you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. And it's booby shoutouts. Thank you to Aunt Julie from Caitlin. Happy birthday to the one who made me a true creeper. To Karina from Jackson, I love you for eternity, and I can't wait to spend my spoopy life with you. Oh, cute. To Momver from Jax, thanks for getting me hooked on Scared to Death. To PD from your dad, Danny, I love and miss you. Danny is in the Air Force right now and away from his family. Oh, and that's from dad. That's nice. Yeah. To Mark from Victoria, oh, this is pretty funny. Wait for me and stop listening without me. Okay, listen. You have to wait, Mark. Stop being a butthead. <laughs> Victor, he is like speeding ahead. And like, so he was already oh. listening. Then she got into it by his, and, but he keeps marching forward and he's not waiting for her. And I just think it's a dick move. <laughs> that is such a funny couple thing. Cause we, we go through that I all the time too. too, where I'm like, well, right now I'm one episode ahead of you on 1883. Ah. I was like, come on, let's go. Well, I, but I also told you not to watch it. I know. But I couldn't. And you did it anyway. Because none of my other apps were working on oh, the flights. Oh, all right. Well, we'll have to find some time where I can watch one episode by myself. Okay. Okay. Um, and I love, by, by the way, I love the messages of, and we've got this on Time Suck for a while and uh, with um, Scared to Death, where you get people writing in who are separated uh, in the military. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, just uh, love being a part of that community in some small way, providing some entertainment for people who are separated from long periods of time from their Mm -hmm. loved ones, whether it's a son, a sibling, but I love those stories where it's like, you know, me and my sister, we, uh, you know, uh, let it, you know, keep up on the same pace with the episodes. And that way we have something to like talk about when I'm, I'm over in, you know, uh, Germany or Afghanistan or wherever it's been, you know, the last like several years. It's Mm -hmm. very, it's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause a lot of times there's what you can talk about. I went out and marched in the hot sun. Yeah. I, I can't talk about what I'm doing over here. Right, because there's a lot of that. Yeah, you can't mm-hmm. talk about it. And I just love, uh, you know, it's so important to like stay connected. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're far, I just love that we get to be a little part of like what helps certain relationships, you know, like stay connected. 
And that's our show. You're so sweet. Thanks. Uh, thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You're welcome. <laughs> you can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. <laughs> thanks to Logan Keith, Liz Hernandez for their work on social media, and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Get those stickers. Uh, thanks to Joe Paisley for producing and directing today and also reminding us to talk about pictures when I forget. <laughs> It's on the resume thing. Or job, job description. Job description. Not resume. That'd be weird. <laughs> resume. I'm really good at reminding people Really good to at reminding stuff. people to look at pictures. Uh, Zach Cohen, custom sound bed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Uh, thanks to book editor Drew Atana, polishing and preparing listener stories for book number three. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans for finding both of the stories I told this week. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch and, yeah, want to hear and watch us. And you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content at Scared to Death Podcast, plus pics that accompany each of the episode's stories, uh, the ones that I tell. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, for fun, good people who also are horror lovers. Thanks to Liz Hernandez for moderating that. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon, get the entire catalog ad-free, uh, and help support the charities we donate to. And you thanks for the ratings and reviews, Creeps and Peepers. Uh, they help us find new listeners and are always appreciated. Now enjoy your nightmares. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Bad Magic Productions.